Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Now, the effects of Christ's death, burial, resurrection, especially as we focus on today, I would like us to think about what actually just happened over the last three days. We have the promise that he would rise from the dead. We had the promise, going back to Genesis 3.15, that this son of a woman would come into this world and would crush the serpent and the serpent's effect in the Garden of Eden. In understanding the significance of the triumph of Christ in his death, burial, resurrection, it's important for us to look at yesterday what actually happened at the time when Jesus said, it is finished. He gave up the ghost. Father, into our hands I commit my spirit. What all happened from that point on until Christ rising from the dead. The Eastern Church has always been very uh, clear on this and many of the Western Christians have sought to also uh, move with it, but the, the Easterners got ahead of everybody in terms of writing hymns and talking about the significance of Christ bringing destruction to Satan and the demons. So one of the uh, early church deacons by the name of Ephraim of Syria, he was ordained in the fourth century He's known, noted for uh, being a theologian and writing various poems and preaching and a lot of literary activities, in particular uh, hymns. But in one of his hom homilies, he said this about the cross of Christ. He who was also the carpenter's glorious son set up his cross above death's all-consuming jaws and led the human race into the dwelling place of life. Since a tree had brought about the downfall of human, humankind, it was also upon a tree that humankind crossed over to the realm of life. Bitter was the branch that had once been grafted upon that ancient tree, but sweet the young shoot that has now been grafted in, the shoot in which we are meant to recognize the Lord whom no creature can resist. We give glory to you, Lord, who raised up your cross to span the jaws of death like a bridge by which souls might pass from the region of the dead to the land of the living. We give glory to you who put on the body of a single mortal and made it the source of life for every other mortal. You are incontestably alive. Your murderers sowed your living body in the earth as farmers sow grain, but it sprung up and yielded an abundant harvest of people raised from the dead. It's a very important statement in terms of the significance of what transpired. The jaws of death, the jaws, right? The jaw is split. Death where is your sting? The jaws are spread apart, and the cross is right between it all. St. Augustine from the western part of Christianity said that the cross was the devil's mousetrap. Hallelujah! Yes, the cross was the devil's mousetrap. So a theme for this weekend is promise and deliverance. The promise of God, going back to Genesis 3.15. He shall bruise your heel and you shall crush his head. And the significance of what happened over this weekend is that no longer does Satan have the power that he once did. He cannot deceive the nations now from receiving the gospel. And we saw that in the early church in less than 40 years St. Paul on four occasions says that the gospel went to all the nations within the empire, within, within the world at that time. It went beyond the Roman Empire. It went into the depths of Africa, into Ethiopia and beyond. Now, what else happened during this time of uh, deliverance? Well, in the early church, St. Irenaeus, second century, and this goes in, in conjunction with our epistle lesson yesterday. If you've been doing the daily readings 
in the lectionary. It says that Jesus went and preached to the spirits in prison. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 19 was a passage that we read uh, even in our home, uh, even with my, our five-year-old grandson trying to explain to him what the significance of Holy Saturday is all about. And Irenaeus said this. He said, I heard from a certain presbyter who heard it from those who had seen the apostles that our Lord descended to the places beneath the earth and preached his gospel to those who were there. And all believed in him who had foretold his advent. The just, the prophets, the patriarchs whose sins he forgave as he does ours. That's Irenaeus, St. Irenaeus. The uh, Puritans put it this way, wherein consists Christ's humiliation? And the answer to that question is, Christ's humiliation consisted in him being born, and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God and the cursed death of the cross, in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. That comes from the Westminster uh, confessional statement and the catechisms. Well, as Anglicans, because the Westminster guys came out of the Church of England, the Anglicans had already been confessing this. And in our 39 articles of religion, uh, going back to the 1500s, confessing Anglicans have, in our th Article 3, we have this statement in our 39 articles. And it's entitled, Of the Going Down of Christ into Hell. That's an important statement. It's in the Apostles' Creed. We know that to be true. Uh, it's not in the Nicene Creed, but that doesn't mean that it's not true. It's just not. There was controversy on whether or not it should be in there. There was differences of opinion. But in the uh, 39 Articles, Article 3, it says, As Christ died for us and was buried, so also is it to be believed that he went down into hell. So what is meant by that? Well, we have what's called the uh, harrowing of hell. In the Western part of Christianity in particular, there's a great emphasis of this. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, in the medieval period of time, saw the need to actually articulate this in four different ways, giving terminology for these levels within the underworld. I'm not going to go there today. If you want to know about this, you can come to one of my classes where I teach this in theology. But I will say, if we had this icon, like, big enough for us all to see, I should have probably sent it to you to put on the bulletin, Mark. But the Eastern Church has, had all, has all sorts of icons over the centuries about what happened on Holy Saturday. And uh, you got over here to the side, the crushing of Satan, the, the dragon being under the feet, right? You have Christ reaching out to Adam and Eve and all the patriarchs and bringing them in, preaching the gospel to them. Now, how did Jesus do that? Did he do it with his soul and his body? Was his body still in the grave? And his soul went into hell? Now, this is not the place of damnation. Some think it was the place of damnation. This is the area of Abraham's bosom that Jesus talked about. He came and he preached to those within Abraham's bosom. But in this icon also, you see the wicked over to the side. I was showing this to my grandson yesterday. The wicked are crying out for help. But I said, did you notice, none of them have any halos over them. These are people that didn't want anything to do with God. Now they do because they want to get out of the torment. But they're stuck there. There's a chasm there. Uh, Christianity, since the uh, side effects of some parts of the Enlightenment movement, has uh, in many ways diminished hell. Jesus actually talked more about hell than he did heaven. But, but what is meant by 
Christ descended into hell. You're going to have to excuse me. With all the wind blowing, I am extremely dry. I need to drink this protein drink to keep, uh, <laughs> keep going here. Not that I don't have any energy. I have energy. It's just my mouth is extremely dry from singing a lot, I think. Um, the third article in the 39 articles emphasizes Jesus' descent into hell, and it's based on what is confessed in the Apostles' Creed, where it says that Jesus descended into hell, or descended into the place of the departed, or some, even in some versions and some prayer books, uh, modern ones will say he descended to the dead. And that's accurate. He went to the place of the departed souls. Well, what did Jesus do in hell? Lots of different opinions. I just happen to have a, like one section from uh, Bishop Harold Brown's uh, commentary on the 39 articles. It was just, Mark, did you ever read it, the whole thing? Yeah, I thought you did, yeah. It's, it's, a, um, it's considered the best work uh, on the 39 articles. And I just copied a few pages here. I could go over all sorts of things of differences of opinion. But I will say this, that um, even though we don't have any evidence of it coming into some kind of written creed until about the year 400, we find the early church fathers even then, in some of the writings where they're, where they're giving creedal statements, have not necessarily included it in their creedal statement, but you find it in their writings, this constant reference to Christ descending into hell. Who were some of those people? Just for the moment, I'll give you some information. Uh, it's, the, it's the general acceptance as an article of faith by all the early church fathers of the church. Ignatius, Hermas, Justin Martyr, Irenaeus, Tertullian, Clement, of Alexandria, Origen, Cyprian, have all clearly spoken on this subject. Besides the later fathers, Cyril, Ambrose, Jerome, Augustine, and even later the Archbishop of Constantinople, Chrysostom. Now in the writings of, of Saint Athanasius, there's this, uh, and this is an interpretation by Lord King in reference to what Athanasius Athanasius has written, uh, and here's the quote, that whilst Christ's body lay buried in the grave, this is to answer the previous question, did Christ go with his body to the departed, uh, to Abraham's bosom, or did he just go as his soul? So we find this in, in Athanasius, that whilst Christ's body lay buried in the grave, his soul went into hell to perform in that place those several actions and operations which were necessary for the complete redemption and salvation of mankind, that he performed after his death different actions by his two essential parts. By his body, he lay in the grave. By his soul, he went into hell and vanquished death. So again, there's some differences of opinion amongst uh, even uh, in some of the reformers later. Well, the point is, Christ did descend into hell. Uh, and according to various early church fathers, it was his soul went into hell. Why is that important? Why was it included in the Apostles' Creed? Well, mainly because of two groups of people, Arians and the Apollinarians. Two uh, groups of people that were heretics. And so it was necessary to put that in the Apostles' Creed to bring a statement concerning, because there was a denial in, from, uh, from the Arians and the Polinarians, uh, they denied the existence of a natural human soul in Jesus Christ. So therefore the, the fathers saw the need to put that in the Creed. As Anglicans, we confess this, that he descended into hell. He descended to the dead. But he led captivity captive. It was all about Christ the victor, Christ having victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. But, uh, but it's, it's basically 
uh, if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, where it says, as much as Christ ascended, he therefore descended into the lower parts of the earth. Why? Because Christ spoke the victorious message of it is finished, the work is complete, Jesus had shed his blood as the atoning sacrifice, and therefore he brought the good news to the Old Testament saints that had been waiting, that had been anticipating. I kind of looked at, I was reflecting on this uh, this week, and I thought in a sense, it's kind of like the, the commandment that we just recited. Honor your father and your mother. So in a sense, Jesus, I th- Jesus was so obedient to the law of God, even after death, he's honoring the fathers and the mothers from the Old Testament time, going back to Adam and Eve and preaching the gospel to them. Hallelujah. Now, check it out. But that's kind of a, that's, you know, um, I didn't run this one past the bishop, but, but, but I think, you know, reflecting on this, the whole point of honoring your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. In general, how that is understood, Christ, even in uh, that being his command, goes to the fathers and the mothers, the ancient fathers and the mothers, and brings them in. So the temple veil was rent in two. Now, my grand, our grandson, Bryson, really gets this. Like, what was on the veil, Bryson? He goes, two cherubs, two cherubim. And what happened when the, when the veil was split in two? He understood, and he, he, he quoted to me yesterday from a book that's written uh, in response to this whole theme of that heaven, you, we could not go into paradise. It was Paradise Lost. Who wrote on that, Paradise Lost? Milton, yeah, Milton. It was Paradise Lost, but at the point when Jesus is, it is finished, and the veil tears apart, the cherubim are set aside, and now we have access into the Holy of Holies, which means what Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today, after he confessed his sin to Jesus, Today you will be with me where? In paradise. So this is the whole thing of now paradise restored. We now can go in. The cherubim are set aside. We have access for, through God's grace to come boldly to his throne of grace every day. We have complete access. We don't have to show a vaccine passport at the gate to the cherubim. And, and being accepted or rejected. No, we go, we go in. We pass go. We collect more than $200, if you like playing Monopoly. All right, we go into the throne area of Christ. We worship our Lord, but we also see the significance of what he did. He went to the Old Testament saints first and said, here, and some of the icons of the, uh, the iconographers in the Eastern Church are quite cre- incredible. Uh, but there are some where you just see Jesus stomping down on the gates of death, cracking it. You see grave, you see actually like caskets and that breaking. You see that Christ is calling forth the righteous that had been waiting for him in Abraham's bosom. How do we know this to be true? Again, turn to Matthew chapter 27. This was not in my sermon notes, but I'm, I think it would be important for us to look at this, this passage. What actually happened when Jesus said, it is finished? So Matthew 27, and go down to verse 51. And behold, 
The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the whom? Saints, who had fallen asleep, were raised, and coming out of the tombs. Now, this is when Jesus is still on the cross, right? I mean, his body is still on the cross. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. So we have these saints wandering about the city. Not like in the movies of zombies, but these are saints that have been raised. Now, Jesus said there's going to be signs in the heaven above and, and the earth beneath before, the, the, before my coming. And I think he's speaking of the, the temple being destroyed. Prior to that, phenomenal things were going to take place, and this is one of them right at the crucifixion of Christ. All right. It's important for us to understand the significance of his descent into hell because he gives the word of victory. Christ is risen. He hadn't been raised in his body yet. His body, if Athanasius is correct on this, I, I kind of lean in that he was right. <laughs> I lean in that direction. The, the the point is, is that his body was in the grave, but his soul went into the place of the departed, into hell, the place of the dead. That's important for us to see the whole picture of what we see today when we as Christians say, Christ is risen. Now in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 10, three signs of his resurrection. The stone is rolled away. There's the empty tomb and the grave clothes, cl grave cloths and the face cloth are neatly folded. Mary taught Jesus how to clean his room, I would think, because it says clearly in the text that everything was, neat, it was neatly folded. It's just a side comment, observation. On Sunday, Mary Magdalene was the first to arrive, verse 1 of St. John 20. Verse 2, Mary ran to tell Peter and John about the stone's removal. And then it's, she says, we. She said, we. Well, who are the we that she's referring to? Well, in Matthew 28, verse 1, the other Mary, the mother of James, is a part of the we that she's referring to in, that is in John 20. But if you go to Mark 16, verse 1, Salome is also mentioned. John doesn't mention them. But they're mentioned in the other gospel writers, in the evangelist. Uh, and then Luke 24, verse 10, Joanna and other women. The ladies were there at the tomb. That's significant. That's very significant. Why does St. John refer only to Mary here, Mary Magdalene? Well, Mary Magdalene experienced Jesus' promise and deliverance personally. So if we look at the whole week, a holy week and up to today, the first day, the eighth day, the day of resurrection, we see this emphasis with Mary Magdalene. John wants us to see she experienced deliverance from demons already. And now she's there. She hasn't forgotten what transpired in her life. Bishop Lancelot Andrews puts it this way about Mary Magdalene, because she loves so much. She was last at his cross and first at his grave. She stayed longest there and was soonest here. She could not rest till she was up to seek him. She sought him while it was yet dark, even before she had light to seek him by. That's Mary Magdalene. The promise for Mary's ongoing deliverance is seen in John 20. Her gratitude for the deliverance she experienced earlier caused her to believe again. This time she found no rest until she could visit his tomb. Her willingness to press through
through her fears after Jesus' death caused her to believe again in the promise and deliverance of her Savior. She then goes for the second time to the tomb again. Not once, she goes twice. She meets up with two angels and they speak. Then she speaks to one that she thought was the gardener. And then Jesus said, Mary. Doesn't it give you goosebumps? You were there. Just picture what Mary, she thinks it's a gardener. And he says, Mary. He knows us by name. Our names are written in his book, the Lamb's Book of Life, but he knows us by name. Hallelujah! This is the beauty of Easter. Then her fears were vanquished when she saw the promised deliverer because he arose. Our fears can over, be overcome when we look also to the risen Christ. When we come to the Eucharist today, and we hear the comfortable words of Christ saying, Come unto me, all you who travel and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. Now, verses 3 through 10, Peter and John are now motivated. The guys finally decide, oops, the ladies are ahead of us. And so they take off. John outruns Peter. Peter is the first to step out of the boat to follow Jesus. He was the first to say that he will follow Jesus and leave everything behind. He did a lot of things in haste. He was a sanguine. Yet his life will come into order. P Peter's a good example of somebody that really screws up big time, sticks his big foot in his mouth at times at the wrong time, and yet other times he gets it right. I've said this before, I'll say it again. Throughout the Gospels, you'll read, and Peter answered and said, and Peter answered and said, and Peter answered and said, even when nobody asked a question, his mouth was always going. Kind of reminds you of someone, right? Right? Yes. Right? Yeah. These two women here have to put up with guys that are always talking. I can identify with Peter. By the way, before I was 16, I was not talkative. But I had a Pentecost experience, and all I'll say is I became very bold and outspoken for the gospel of Christ since that time. And it hasn't gone away. The promise to Peter was this, that the church's growth would come through Jesus' suffering. And, and, and even Jesus said, Peter, Satan desires to sift you as wheat, but I've prayed for you. And the, you could imagine the anguish that Peter went through. I'll never deny you, Lord. And then he denies the Lord three times. And yet, Jesus restores him three times, not at the Last Supper, but at the first breakfast. First breakfast, after he jumped out of the boat and swam ashore and had fish with Jesus and bread, and it was there Jesus said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Three times. It was necessary for Jesus to say it to Peter three times. Why? Because every time he said it, it was a, it was a restoration for Peter. Right? Feed my sheep, feed my little lambs, feed my sheep. And then we know the rest of the story about Peter. Peter had difficulty with Jesus' plan to suffer and die, yet Jesus corrected him. Peter had come to terms with Jesus' promise to rise after his death, and he did. How so? Well, Peter ran to the tomb. And why did Peter run? The promise of his resurrection guaranteed deliverance to the world. We are challenged to run to Christ's promises for deliverance from evil today, still. We still need to run to him. He's already delivered, but he, he will deliver us again because he, his name is Jesus. 
the Lord who saves, the one, the one who delivers. We are challenged to run into Christ's promises. The church will grow through the purging and preparation times that we live in. Always keep that in mind, church. Jesus said, while you are in the world, you will have trials, but be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And if we don't think it was possible, these are the reminders that he overcame. Satan is crushed. He crushed his, Satan's head. Anybody with a crushed head has a wacky brain. Satan does not think straight. Don't ever think that he does. He doesn't. Jesus punks Satan all the time. He lets him do things, and then Satan sets up a scenario, and then the church emerges and comes on the scene, and the gospel is preached, and the people that have been coming together quite often get saved. And so Satan has limited power. God is all-powerful. God is omnipotent. Satan is potent, but not that potent, just with his lies. But if you want to believe his narrative, Go for it, but I don't want you to really go for it. Like, I'm going to be here to remind you, don't go for those narratives of Satan because it's just full of deception. Oh, Jesus was seen at least 11 times after his resurrection throughout the Gospels to Mary Magdalene alone, to certain women, to Simon Peter alone, to two disciples going to Emmaus, to 10 apostles at Jerusalem and some others excluding Thomas, to 11 apostles at Jerusalem, Thomas being present this time, to seven disciples fishing at the sea, to 11 apostles on a mountain in Galilee, to more than 500 brethren at once, to James only, and to the apostles and others during his ascension from Mount, Mount Olivet. 11 different accounts we have in the Gospels and in the book of Acts and in 1 Corinthians that he was seen again and again and again. Christ's exaltation, wherein cons consists Christ's humiliation in him being born and that in a low condition, made under the law, undergoing the miseries of, of the life itself and to death, even the death of the cross, and in continuing under the power of death for a time. But wherein consists Christ's exaltation? Christ's exaltation consists in his rising again from the dead on the third day, in ascending up into heaven, in sitting at the right hand of God, the Father, and in coming to judge the world at the last day. That's Christ's exaltation. And that's the will come in the future. The cross is the bridge which unites promise and deliverance. The cross, the jaw of death has been, the jaw has been opened, and the cross is stuck between the jaw of death. It cannot, it cannot close. The cross has caused death to just submit to the all-powerful, glorious power of our risen Savior and King. Believe the promise that Christ rose for our justification, that's satisfaction guaranteed. Enjoy the promise that Christ accepted us in the church. We are now in Him and He is in us. Believe in His deliverance. Christ guaranteed our salvation to free us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. And we are now called to enjoy his deliverance. Believe it and then enjoy his deliverance. Christ forgave us through his sacrifice once for all. And then we come to the table as the reminder for the covenant renewal that he has done this for us. We don't deserve it, but he's called us by his grace. And to that we say, thank you. Amen.